okay, so this is my assessment that I run. The biggest thing that I'm looking for is looking at the perspectives of primal movement patterns, how our body sets up, and if some of those imbalances are kind of like affecting how we create movements or execute movements, okay? Mm -hmm. I start usually with just some measurements, specifically your weight, your height, what your actual measurements are on your body. Then we get into like a standing posture analysis. We look at some passive range of motion tests for the hip joint and the shoulder joint. Uh, there's three pertinent tests that we're gonna do that are a little bit more important than the other ones. We'll get there as we move along. Um, but that, that comes from the anterior summary, as I call it, and then the posterior summary where you're lying down and those are some joint integrity tests, okay? And moving forward, we look at your gait pattern, right? And we're not gonna break down your uh, sprinting mechanics, but we'll break down like your walking mechanics, okay? Uh, we'll look at a walking one, which is another primal movement pattern. We look at a push pattern. We change some of the elements of a traditional push-up to really uh, expose some of the limitations that a lot of people have, okay? And you'll see that when we get there. Uh, we look at some core strengthening, some spinal stabilization. Um, I kind of address the importance of certain exercises that are staple programs or staple exercises and programs, what such as, staple? so like a plank for instance, okay. right? We're gonna address the importance of a plank and when to introduce those types mm -hmm. of movements, like an isometric movement. You're talking about, about cycling. Yeah, okay. yeah, so that's part of it. Um, it's super important to analyze people's feet and their ability to articulate movements through their feet. So that'll be one of those really important tests. Um, we look at the ability to rotate the T-spine, the thoracic spine capabilities, because that's huge too. If I have limitations in my T-spine, a lot of things are gonna go wrong, okay? Um, and then again, we finish off with our hip strength, okay? And then also looking at a pull pattern. Okay. From all those summaries, I can give you an idea as to what we definitely need to work on in the short term. A lot of the times it's reducing inflammation and dysfunction. And then as those things become better, you can introduce forms of resistance. Okay. And those can be in varying angles, situations, intensities, you name it. Okay? But again, I use this to give people perspective and to also allow me to develop the proper programs for them. Because if I didn't do this portion, I'd be guessing. Or just be doing it generally. Right. Right. It's funny we mentioned that though, because a lot of the times with the templates that I've created, a lot of them work universally, okay? But still, it's good to give people perspectives. Because as much as you'd love to specify things, sometimes people fall into a particular mode or a particular, I guess, situation, simply because we're all doing the same patterns. And a lot of people just simply aren't educated on some of these limitations from those patterns or postures. Cool, makes sense. Okay, awesome. Okay, let's get started. So... You know your weight and your height? Um, I believe my weight is 69 still. Okay. I haven't weighed since the last like, two weeks. 69 kgs, do you know what yeah, that is in pound? Uh, probably 150. Okay. And then your height? Uh, five, 173. 5'7, yeah. 5'8. Five, 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 eight. Five, eight. Yeah. Cool, okay. So for men, they get a little bit of a different measurement than women, which you probably already know, yeah? Cool. Move in front of the camera here. First measurement I like to do, and I, I kind of recruited this or adopted this from when I worked with World Health, because they actually have a BMI machine. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they actually get the measurements of your frame. So oh, one of those I got first, that done. Right, one of those first That's measurements. Done. Yeah, yeah, one of the first measurements that we do uh, is actually the length of your right arm, because it kind of tells us how long your frame is, okay? so. I'll get you to lift your arm up three times. I'm gonna find where your digit of your shoulder joint starts. You can drop it down. Two more. One more. Good. 73 centimeters. And I always measure in centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, weight is in pounds. Height is in foot and inches. Okay. More like metric systems. Yeah, okay. Men get a chest measurement, obviously women wouldn't be a little yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Lift both arms. Alright. Put your arms down. Okay. 93 centimeters. Men get one waist measurement because they don't have like an extended hip frame usually. Mm -hmm. It's usually just straight down. Okay. Yeah. And that'll be at the belly button. Four 
nanometers. Again, a little bit different than a woman's measurement. Women usually get a hips measurement. A lot of them are really focused on that component because their hips float to some degree or they extend. We would measure at their waist. For men, we just measure at the, like, the thigh and the, the right calf, okay? You don't need to get anybody to change their position. They just simply got to stand where they feel comfortable. 59 centimeters. Because if they start doing this, it throws off the measurement. All right. And right calf. So would you go right side first and then you're going... I don't side. necessarily make time to measure both sides. Okay. I think part of doing the measurements is just getting a perspective or an idea of that person's frame. Okay. Unless they're going into bodybuilding and they have to have symmetry in the sense of what their body looks like visually, mm -hmm. it's not really important. You know what I mean? Unless they've had a crazy drastic injury and now like one of their legs is half the size. But we've already known that if they've had an injury and they can't use that muscle or muscles, it's going to atrophy and shrink anyways. You can see that visually, right? You don't necessarily need to get that in depth with the measurement. Measurement just gives you an idea where you start. Cool. And, and you also did that with the consultation because you're asking me what injuries I have. Yeah, absolutely, right? And like I said, you're just you're aligning things and you're keeping things consistent because you're building a system. When you're doing your training and you're working on uh, components when you're with somebody as opposed to when they're on their own if your systems correlate typically speaking they'll understand it because you can have a great conversation and a great perspective with people in the session but then they go back to life and they're gonna have to navigate those components of stress and other relationships and other commitments and then they come to the gym they're gonna want to try to remember what you have created for them and maybe they have all this disturbance they have all this fog and resistance in front of that if you're able to build those consistent systems or templates, give them a kind of like a consistent understanding of what they're dealing with and how they're gonna fix some of those things and then in turn move into performance and progression, those are parts of it. Cool. Okay? All right. So at this point after I do measurements, I typically look at postural analysis. Why would we look at postural analysis? Because not always, but a lot of the times how you set up is how you're gonna produce or manifest movement. If your posture is typically imbalanced, your movements will be imbalanced. Over a period of time and you increase the intensities and resistance, does the risk factor go up for injuries? Absolutely. Does the risk factors go up for imbalances in muscle development and losing opportunities or efficiency? Absolutely. Okay, so we do this to kind of start painting that picture, so to speak. Okay, so if I start with postural analysis and your posture is all out of whack, um, that gives me an idea and it can make a prediction that when you go to do certain movements, they're gonna be really limited. They'll be efficient at some and then limited at others, but not always, okay? And that's why we start with postural analysis and then we progressively go into more and more tests to really paint that full picture, okay? So, what do you think optimal posture should look like? Straight. Yeah, yeah. okay. Let's talk about that. I don't want you to fix anything, okay? Optimal posture should have our feet over our shoulder blades, or sorry, over our hips, okay? We shouldn't have our feet externally biased, okay, or it shouldn't be internally biased, okay? What I should be doing is aligning my joints, and that's using the properties of torque. I use that word a lot, okay, because building torque sets our body up for proper execution with efficiency and not putting our body at risk in bad position with alignment and execution and activation, okay? So, the feet are straight ahead. My knees kick out over the fourth and fifth toe. My pelvis isn't going to be in what we call an extended anterior rotation or an extended posterior. It's simply neutral. Our shoulder blades shouldn't necessarily be kicking forward. They should be naturally resting beside our body with our hands resting comfortably beside our thighs. And our head position matters too. That's part of our spinal alignment. There's, you know, you have your C-spine that's connected to your T-spine and your lower spine. So that has to be in a neutral position as well. Okay, what do you think happens to people? Do they have good posture? No, not at all, okay? And again, that's why they're predisposed to problems. If you can figure that out for people and now have the proper program designed to address those problems first, 
they will forever be in your debt because now you've learned how to fix some of those problems and then when they go to execute, they can feel the right muscle groups working, they get what they're supposed to get for those said, you know, big box exercises such as squats and deadlifts and lunges and stuff like that. If you don't address this, you'll always be playing run around. Then you're just guessing, okay? So anyways, let's analyze your posture. So I want you to just let things go. We'll get you back up here so you can kind of see. Okay. Now, if we were to analyze your posture, is there some asymmetries? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. My friend here is a soccer player. You're right footed. Yeah, both. Both. But which one are you better with? Right. right. Yeah. Okay. You probably chop the ball off. Yeah. Okay. So it expresses itself in your posture. Okay. You have an asymmetry, but you have an external bias. And it really depends on the amount of patterning or the amount of work that you typically do. You think a lot of soccer players have external biases? Absolutely. They retrieve the ball in that position. Okay? But why is this an issue? The body has to find a way to find homeostasis or balance. So typically speaking, if I have an external bias in my feet, the upper body says, well, that's too much, and I'm typically going to be concave in that same position to get some balance. Okay? Also, if I have an external bias in my feet, typically speaking, I don't recruit a lot of glute and hamstring activation. I put a lot of stress on the external processes of my ankle and my knee joint, okay? And my change of direction is very limited because I don't have the proper initiation through my feet and ankles to now compose a cohesive change or transition, okay? It also affects balance. If I'm like this all the time and I get hit with some type of, you know, interference, something hits you, wind, whatever it may be, you can't recover. Okay, we're gonna talk about this as we keep going on, but that's essentially what we want to get in the habit of doing, building torque here, okay? So if we keep analyzing your posture, again, set it off. Typically speaking, if I have that external bias, what you'll see is an aggressive lower back curve, okay? And again, this is gonna manifest itself in some other movements, okay? If we look at your hand position, it's starting to come a little concave, but not aggressively, but again, our hand should be here, okay? And what will also happen from that, when I have this and this going on, is usually my head will come forward, okay? And this is important. If I start to get that forward head position, what do you think that's putting pressure on? The traps, okay? It's also putting pressure on my shoulder joints. So what else that attached to? Not just muscle, but what else? The respiratory system, okay? It's attached to the diaphragm. It's attached to my heart. And if these are always concave and tight, am I supplying the right oxygen in my body? Probably not, okay? Am I creating enough space for the shoulder joint to move properly? No, I'm limited. So anytime I get out of that box or that movement pattern, I'm at risk because the tissues are just too chronically tight. Does that make sense? 100%. Okay, so it's imperative to get these things fixed for people, okay? so. We look at your head position, it's not crazy, but it's starting to come through. And what'll typically happen, because you're taught to work on performance training, is these get chronically tight, okay? And you're always heading the ball and taking contact and running with impact. So is this draining your energy? Absolutely. So there has to be a way where you're combating these problems off the hop. And we talked about that in the consultation, right? The ability to reduce the tension prior to committing to creating more resistance or tension. That's why we start with rollouts, okay? As opposed to getting the body fired up and getting some blood flowing. Blood flow comes from compression and rollouts. Friction comes from that. Your body responds and gives you a feedback. And the feedback we want when we start every workout is to get that full renewal so your body's ready to go, okay? So that's why we deal with these things. So if we were to analyze his posture, he has an external bias, okay? But that external bias is probably recruiting less tension and tightness or activation of the posterior chain, okay? You're getting that excessive lower back curve. This separates the control or the cohesive stabilization that you have here. The shoulders start to round forward to match that and the head will start to come forward. So where else is, the, where else is this also a problem? Every day, you drive in your car, you read your phone, you're reading, you're typically leading into those patterns. So the type of design that you want for programs is again, to address some of those limitations, okay? That all makes sense? 100%. Awesome, so, like I said, I'm gonna analyze his posture. We would summarize that with simple words so I can research it later when I'm gonna build your program. So I would just say, external bias in foot, 
and then in bracketed right, right foot more so, right? It's turning out. Lower back, excessive curved. Okay, and then shoulders slightly rotate forward, so does the head. All right, so the next portion we're gonna do here, may wanna pause it and start a new program, if you'd like for a new 